very easily aggravating factors. Video footage of protesters fighting with police at the doors of the Capitol building have been among the more common scenes used by media outlets, trying to paint the protesters as violent. Yet the full context of that scene is often left out. When the video evidence is shown in its full context, it's clear the crowd is trying to rescue Roseanne Boyland as police beat her unconscious body. To get the deeper context of the crowd and what took place, we met with Luke Coffey, the man who pushed the police back using a crutch, which then allowed other protesters to pull Roseanne from the tunnel. I was walking back to the hotel and I was approached by three different men, kind of younger guys that were running away from the Capitol and were basically telling uh, people that we need patriots at the Capitol. There are people dying inside. We need patriots. But it was, I thought it was strange because they were running away from the Capitol and we were still at least a mile probably away. I was prodded at that point by the Lord really to, to I wanted to go up there to the front and try to stop the chaos and confusion and, and wh whatever was going on. I didn't know, I didn't know anything at this point. So initially when they approached me, it was, it was, uh, I, I felt it would just, it stood out as a very strange occurrence that they were um, trying to get people to go up there and why were they running away from it? It was, it was bizarre really. And I had a, a friend that is, uh, I would consider a conspiracy theorist by nature and he warned me that there could be a false flag incident that day, be very careful. And it, that's immediately what I thought, that these gentlemen were trying to escalate pro provocateurs that were working to get people up there. I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me and say, go up and to the front and pray. And it was very clear voice. I think there are three voices in our head, our own, the Holy Spirit, if you know Jesus, and demonic spirits that can influence you. I know it was not my own voice and it was the Lord that very much told me and I felt it was a prodding on my heart to go up there regardless of the risk and just pray and and pray for peace. As I was walking up there it did I felt like there were saints you know that were making eye contact going out of their way to make eye contact with me and this is a crowd of 20 to 30,000 people but it was certain people that were just still and peaceful and just making, they'd give me a little nod or just make eye contact with me. And you know, the eyes are the window of the soul and it was something incredible that really has stood out um, to me and I haven't told a lot of people. It was an overcast day for the most part, but the clouds opened up and I did see these strips of paper coming down. They were verses that were, encouraged me to continue on and I don't think other people saw them, and I know I wasn't hallucinating, um, but it was prodding me to continue on. And uh, and again, people can think I'm nuts, but until you experience these things, uh, you, you may be a doubter. So when I saw the, the verses coming down, it only solidified what God had told me to go up there. They were at one point, several points, at several points they were, the crowd was out there singing Amazing Grace. It was a picturesque experience that was, I felt like God gave me a glimpse of uh, heaven in this chaos and confusion that was going around was this beautiful, peaceful thing happening, which uh, which I, I know was a gift and, and uh, it was truly incredible and, and that's what led me to, to go up to the uh, West Side Terrace. When I went up there, they started deploring the tear gas. People started falling backwards on top of each other and were trying to get away because they couldn't breathe from the tear gas. I saw multiple women that I tried to help that were on the bottom of three to four people piled deep. And I was, with no success, was able to pull them out. So at that point, I went to the crowd and was saying, we got to stop this. We got to pray. Roseanne was one of the people I saw up at the top of the steps that I was trying to help out, along with several other women that were underneath. And people were screaming out that they couldn't breathe. And it was very traumatic. The gas made everybody freak out and, and caused more chaos. And uh, so everyone had fallen on top of each other. And so I went up to the front telling them, 
everyone stop and pray because I really believe people were going to die. I thought people were going to perish underneath that, that crowd because it was just jam-packed. People crying out maybe for their last breaths. At that point is where I did hear the voice of the Lord say, Luke, go stand in the gap. And, uh, and at the same, around the same time, these three other guys were talking about that we need to do something so this doesn't happen again. So this, so to de-escalate it, to, to prevent it from happening again. The, a couple of these guys were like, I, I don't want to risk going up there. And, and one said, I got my family to think of. And I said, I'm single, I'll go up there. And, and uh, so I tried to walk as peacefully and slowly as I could um, and go right up to the line of, of police. And I didn't know how many there were. I did see that they were swinging and it was violent and there were people on both sides swinging. And so I said, stop immediately. Stop guys, we're all Americans, stop. I was immediately sprayed with pepper spray directly to my face and was being hit as well. So I couldn't see well, obviously, but I looked down and happened to see a crutch that I guess had just flown up there and landed at my feet. And so I was prompted to pick it up and put it over my head. The most peaceful thing I could do is make myself big and try to make a wall between both parties. I don't know if it's audible in the recordings, but I said, in, in the name of Jesus, Lord, please stop this. And then I turned around and said it to the crowd, stop, everyone stop. And then I was hit in the back, which prompted me to turn around and put the crutch in a defensive manner uh, in front of me. It was a fighter, I can say it was a fight or flight response to being a, uh, attacked. And, and, you know, the crutch was never meant to be used in, in any other way than to defend myself or peace, to peacefully make a stand and then to defend myself. There was a reason and it wasn't a coincidence. And I do, I, I don't believe in coincidences. I believe they're, they're fingerprints on our lives, evidence of God's greater plan. And so I wasn't that surprised that that's where Roseanne was. Um, and I, I just wish more could have been done to save her life. One of the biggest crossroad moments of my life was first experiencing getting hit by a car with the love of my life over my shoulder and uh, her perishing that evening. What I learned from that experience is that God is the author of our lives. He is the great um, director. He is, uh, he is in control, he's sovereign, he's providential. And God used what was the my worst nightmare to show to really show up and and in my life, and so it was the that was the hard, it's it's weird to say, but it was the greatest moment and the worst moment in my life when I lost her. So when for, to have another woman in my proximity. Um, is very, I don't know what, what to say about it. But the FBI reached out and I immediately called him back and told him the story just like I've told you, told him that I did have contact with the police, and but I was very much trying to break it up. And, and even he said, Mr. Coffey, it looks like you were trying to deescalate things. He said, you're not a suspect at this point. And for about 14 or 15 days, I was told I was not a suspect. Initially, he said, if, if they charge you anything, it will be a misdemeanor, disorderly conduct. But he said, they may not charge you at all. You know, it says you were, it looks, it looks like you were trying to de-escalate things. Or... <clears throat> so, you know, 10 or 12 days later, he said, Mr. Coffey's not looking good for you. And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, well, we've seen some new evidence and uh, we're gonna need you to uh, come in and talk to us. And I said, well, let me let my lawyer talk to you. Didn't have a lawyer at the time, but I quickly got one and uh, hired one and, and uh, who negotiated what became me turning myself in to the FBI in Dallas. I spent 45 days in a prison down here in Texas, Limestone County. I've had two plea deals come in, one of which was four to five years, pleading guilty to a felony assault with a deadly weapon, the crutch being the deadly weapon. 
When I met with my lawyers most recently, I was able to go to Midland, Texas, where they are for several days. And they had a potential plea deal that was similar to another defendant that was eight to 14 months, but still pleading guilty to a felony assault with a deadly weapon. I just know I feel called to fight for truth, not for just myself, but for other J6ers. The only thing they can do is kill me or put me back in prison, and I'm not scared either way. So I'm ready to do whatever God calls me, and whatever he wills it for my life. It's my absolute full intention to go to trial.